Today's video subject, as chosen by my ever generous supporters on Patreon, is why has the United States forgotten about the First World War? And of course, at its most literal level, that's kind of a silly question to ask, because of course, the United States has not forgotten about the First World War. There are still monuments and memorials to the conflict in this country. There are commemorations held every single year for it, uh, even if, you know, not paid as much attention to as I would personally appreciate. Um, and even the success of films like They Shall Not Grow Old in this country, which uh, I think did exceed expectations, I think it did, um, it shows that there is an indeed an active interest in the conflict. I mean, even, you know, there is quite a healthy and rapidly expanding reenacting scene for the First World War in this country. Um, so obviously, at its most literal level, the United States has not forgotten about the conflict. But all the same, I don't think it would be terribly controversial for me to say that when compared with nations over in Europe, like France, Belgium, uh, the UK, that the First World War in the United States does not have the same um, cultural weight, cultural significance that it does over there. But even if the First World War was not, for the United States, a, an existential war, a war of survival for their very way of life and their system of government, as it was, by way of example, for Austria-Hungary, for Germany, for even for Russia, um, it was still, of course, a very, you know, significant conflict. They weren't at risk so much of losing their empire if they lost, like, say, the British or the French, but still, it uh, was a very important war for American interests abroad. And, of course, what's more is, you know, alongside the fact that it was a very economically, uh, politically, sort of uh, realpolitik style, significant war for the United States, it was also, you know, a, a very, um, it was still a culturally significant thing, at least one would think. The First World War was among the first, many call it indeed the first, uh, industrialized war, a war which saw so many uh, new creations. The, 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 it displayed the terror of barbed wire, the magnificent power of armored vehicles, of tanks and whatnot. It you know, unveiled the, the, the use of chemical warfare and, and uh, of incredible sickness in the form of Spanish flu, things like that. It, it was, long story short, it was terrifying, you know. It was, it was a war, this is a good way, I think, to wrap all that up. The First World War was a war unlike the world had ever seen before. And even though it had been fighting, been waging for a number of years before the United States entered, that still, one would think, would have had a very lasting impact on those soldiers, those officers, those men who went over to fight in it. Particularly, you know, again, for those American officer classes who had been trained in perhaps earlier styles and who had been uh, raised on stories from their grandfathers about the American Civil War and from their fathers about the um, Spanish-American War and things like that. You know, they're going over with all of those ideas in their mind and the First World War is an extraordinary shock to those mentalities. So you would think that while it certainly wouldn't have carried over to the same extent as it did in the United Kingdom, as in France, as in Germany, things like that, it still would have at least had more of a lasting impact than it seems to have had. You think that there would be more about it in modern American culture, that there would be, even during the time, you know, d during the, um, the contemporary period, you would think that we would see a lot more World War I memorials, a lot more World War I monuments. Because over in, in, for example, the UK, I speak out of personal experience here, but something tells me it's the same way over in France, um, maybe not so in Germany. Um, but there are, in the UK, there are memorials, monuments, statues for heroes of the Great War, for the glorious dead, for just, you know, just lists of, of the fallen and, and, and nameless even commemorations to the war um, everywhere. I mean, you walk into a train station or you're walking into Waterloo Station and a, a train station and they have a great big plaque saying, this is a list of all of our workers who passed away in the conflict. British Railway is posting, that's, that is significant. When a train company is providing their own commemoration to the war dead, you know that it was impactful. When, you know, one of my favorite memories, the first time I ever visited the UK, I, I happened to be visiting at one point a very small uh, town in Wales. I actually forgot the name, unfortunately. Um, very small town, 
And I was just walking through the village, really more of a village, really, um, one day while I was waiting for a train. And I was just walking along a, along a, you know, a pathway. And I happened to notice that there was sort of an overgrown, old, you know, path leading up a very tall hill. And it did seem as though it was being maintained at least a little bit. It wasn't being very commonly used, but it was being maintained as a pathway. So I'm thinking, huh. I wonder what I wonder what's up there, and uh, hoping to myself that I'm not going up, um, you know, up into someone's private property, which was very possible. Um, I thought, all right, well, you know, let's, let's take the walk. So I so I start climbing this hill, and I, I start winding my way around the way, and I reach the top, and it sort of opens up, and there are um, there are two benches there along the side, and right in the middle is a very tiny, you know, probably like. As I remember, at least, it was about four years ago, you understand. Three or four foot high, something like that, obelisk, stone obelisk. And I forgot what it said, of course, but it had a very simple commemoration to the fallen of the First World War. And, and there were names scratched into it. And it was clear that at least there was, you know, one or two people in this little Welsh town who were keeping up with this thing, making sure that it was, um, you know, that it maintained a particular standard. Um, Sorry, I was long aside there, but it, it really shows that, you know, no matter where you go in the United Kingdom, every single village, every town, every company, it seems, to a degree, less so, but, you know, everywhere you go, there is going to be a lingering memory, a monument, a memorial to the terror of that conflict, to the experiences of it. When I went over in... Um, 2018 for the um, centenary commemorations, even trains on the tube had poppies painted on their side and whatnot. It, it's just, it's omnipresent in a way that it just isn't in the United States. I mean, most people, you know, when I was wearing the poppy every day, for example, back during the, um, during the war, you know, during the hundred years since the war, um, most people assumed it was like a sports symbol is the thing. People are completely unaware of what it means. Um, the fact that the war indeed was in its 100-year anniversary, most people, in my experience, weren't really aware, and they, they didn't have a, a, an awareness that the war was really too much of a thing. But that's enough, I think, about the United Kingdom and how it remembers the war, because our subject is, why has the United States largely forgotten about the war? Why are there less memorials here, less monuments, less commemorations, and less of a cultural awareness? Now again, a significant part of that is going to be the simple fact that for the United States, it wasn't as big of a war. It was not an existential conflict as it was in other places. But I think that there's another element as relates to scale, as relates to size, which really helps to bring out that fact. It really helps to reinforce and demonstrate, to show why the United States did not view the First World War and does not view it as significantly as it otherwise might have done. Even if its you know, uh, involvement in the war was exactly the same, were it not for this other factor, I think we'd have a much bigger view of the war than we do currently. But before I get to that point, have to hold you all in suspense, obviously, of course. Um, before I get to that, I think it's important that we do very briefly a discussion on what the First World War represented for those other powers, for the British, for the French, for the Germans, for the Austrians, etc., 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 etc. There were a lot of nations in the war. Um, 1914, when war breaks out, it was, roughly at least, for the most part, the first major conflict between world powers really since the Napoleonic Wars. Now, obviously, there were wars in between the period. There was the Crimean War, which is largely seen as the one which broke down the old concert of Europe and sort of brought in this idea like, oh, hey, Europeans can fight each other again. Um, there was the Franco-Prussian War. There was the... Um, Austro-Prussian War, the Prus Prussian-Austrian, whatever, there were when the Prussians and the Austrians were fighting. Uh, there were, you know, Russia was fighting a couple of its own wars, you know, in other places of the world and whatnot. The British, of course, were continually fighting in their little wars across the world, though they really hadn't been fighting um, other European powers to that point. Uh, France, as well, had been fighting a number of little wars across, for example, Africa and um, Southeastern Asia, things like that. But this was, other than the Franco-Prussian War, the first really big continental war that they were facing. Um, and even then, the Franco-Prussian War, it's, it's meant to understand that, or you must understand that the Franco-Prussian War was 
while certainly very significant, it changed the landscape of Europe forever. It was, as far as the scale of conflict is concerned, a relatively small thing when compared with the Napoleonic Wars. And that, I think, really speaks to how massive the Napoleonic Wars was, is the fact that for a hundred years, every war since was really quite minor and insignificant when compared with the Napoleonic Wars. The First World War, however, was a conflict far surpassing, you know, the Franco-Prussian, the Second Boer War, any of these other conflicts that Europe had been facing to that point. The Victorian era was, for Europe, a period of relative peace. Even with the Age of Revolutions and whatnot, it was a period of relative peace when compared with the ones which came immediately after it, First and Second World War, and the ones which came immediately before it, the Napoleonic Wars, the Seven Years' War, things like that. But for the United States of America, this was not the case. While, yes, the Victorian era in the United States did see a vast series of little wars, largely expansion um, towards the West against the Native Americans, um, and while it did see, yes indeed, a, a massive rise of industrial power, of economic expansion, of wealth and peace and prosperity, it also, right in the middle of, the, of that period, saw the most cataclysmic conflict in all of American history, not only to that point, but even to this day. The most destructive war which it had ever, indeed has, ever seen before. It was right in the middle of that period, 1861 to 1865, the American Civil War, which for the men who were going off to the First World War was within memory, largely, within, you know, generational memory. I, um, I have some statistics here, just some, some things I like to bring out about the American Civil War that help to bring this idea out. And so to, to read those off, I will be putting on my cheaters here. The American soldiers who were going off to fight in the First World War were being raised on, were being so were, were indeed surrounded with the cultural context, the lingering cultural memory of the American Civil War. Uh, by way of example, a man who was 16 years old, for example, in 1861, 16-year-old boy in 1861, very likely to have fought in the American Civil War, would be 73 years old by the time of the end of the First World War in 1918. So he's a grandfather, effectively. Uh, and he is, of course, going to be able to tell his grandsons, oh yes, I remember when I was marching with Sherman to the sea. I remember marching with General Lee. I remember the moment when Stonewall Jackson fell. I remember, you know, the peace treaty at Appomattox. I remember, I remember, I remember. This was their experiences. In that, you know, a lot of us have grandparents who fought in Vietnam or Korea, for example. The stories that they tell us, and as such, the way that we remember those wars being, you know, much more present in our minds than, say, the First World War and the Second World War, that's the same sort of generational gap. That, that's the sort of time frame that we're looking at here. When we think of recent conflicts, those are some of the ones, when we think of significant conflicts, those are some of the ones that come to mind as far as the cultural impact that they have on us because they were so recent. Similarly, actually, a uh, man who was uh, 30 years old in 1861, so a man who could well have been, you know, a, a veteran soldier when the war broke out, would only be 83 years old by the time the First World War ended. Again, he's alive and well, he's experiencing these things, he is telling these stories to the boys who are going off to fight. And indeed, in many cases, these Civil War generations, these generations who fought in and who lived through the direct, the immediate aftermath of the Civil War are the ones sending the American soldiers off to fight in the First World War. Um, in indeed, actually, the last veterans of the war, of the American Civil War, di were dying in the 1950s. This cultural impact, this legacy, lasted a very long time. In the United States, there are not so many uh, memorials and monuments to the First World War, but there are so many to the American Civil War. While 
in the UK, it seems like every village has a memorial to, in, to, um, to the First World War. Here in the United States, every town which was around during the American Civil War seems to have some sort of commemoration. Everywhere, especially here in Massachusetts, even in Ohio, where war memorials and memorization and even any sort of historical knowledge to begin with in Ohio seems so rare. Still, I would, you know, go up to Milan, Ohio, very small town, and in the town square, next to the town hall, wherever it would be, there would be a very tall, significant obelisk to the fallen of that town in the war, because it was so culturally significant. And you look down the list of names on those memorials, and you just see the surnames so many of them being exactly the same because entire villages, entire towns would send their sons and their fathers and their brothers off to fight in this conflict. As far as significance in that way, what was, uh, what the First World War was to so many European nations, the American Civil War was to the United States, North and South. Another really good way of bringing that idea out, of just, just how big, just how massive the American Civil War was, something which I never even really realized until I started looking into it a little bit more, um, the Union, the North, in the American Civil War had a total population of roughly 22 million people, 22 million people. Under arms, the number of soldiers that it had was about 2 million people. That leaves us with a population, with rather a percentage of the population at, under arms as soldiers of roughly 9%. A tenth almost of Union men, uh, of Union people rather, were, you know, during the duration of the war. So really the number would be a little different. But still, overall, looking very broadly at the whole period of the conflict, 10%. 9%, a tenth almost, of the population marched off to war. And of course, it being only men who were really doing the fighting, you can mess with those numbers even more. It would be a very significant portion of the young men who were doing that fighting. In the Confederacy, it was even worse. Nine million men, or nine million people, rather, nine million total population in the Confederate States of America. I'm not certain if that includes slave populations or not, because of course in some states slave populations could well reach up in upwards of half the total population. Um, but of that nine million population figure that I have here at least, one million soldiers under arms for the Confederacy during the war. That's 11 percent thereabouts of the total population standing under arms. Again, over a tenth. On average, um, for the United States on the whole, you know, would be later on, before and after the war, the United States on the whole, um, a total of three million soldiers for a total population of 31 million people. Again, 9.6% of the total population marching off to war. Those numbers are extraordinary. And while we don't see them for the United States in the First World War, those are the sorts of things that we're looking at for the European powers in the First World War. Actually, oftentimes, I imagine, a fair bit less. Um, but again, you don't see numbers like that very regularly until the First World War. As far as casualties are concerned, and again, an excellent way of bringing out that the First World War was for Europe what the American Civil War was for the United States. Uh, total casualties, and these are extraordinary figures. Um, for Britain and its colonies, the United Kingdom and its empire, a total of 2% of the total population was lost in that war. 2%. Extraordinary. In a terrible way, of course. France, even worse. France lost 4% of its total population in that conflict. Austria-Hungary, fairly similar, 35 to 4%, something in between there, is what Austria-Hungary lost in the First World War. And Germany was about the same as Austria, almost, or on the, uh, on the upper limits, around 4, just over 4% of its total population. The First World War. And that's easy to understand, it's easy to imagine, because we all know how 
terrible the First World War, what a meat grinder it was with so many men just marching off to their deaths. Entire generations lost to the meat grinder of the First World War. The American Civil War, which is not often phrased like this, it's not often discussed in this sort of light, saw a total of 620,000 military deaths. Now, obviously, in terms of raw numbers, well, that's nothing compared to the First World War, which had millions upon millions of deaths. But we have to deal not with total numbers. We have to deal with proportion, with, yes, with, with how much that figure is in relation to the total population of the time. You know, if we were to say to New York City, oh, you know, if we were to have a headline and say, oh, you know, 100 soldiers die that came from New York City and say like some sort of new conflict or whatever, 100 New York City men die, that would seem like a very small number because New York City has millions of people in it. If you take away 100 men, though, from a small town in Wisconsin, you've just gutted that town. You, you've completely removed the male population in some of these areas, you know, it's much more significant. You have to look at these things in terms of proportion. Military deaths to the United States, 620,000. Overall casualties for the United States, um, just over a million people. And that represents for the United States about 3% of its total population. 3%. 1% more than the British lost in the war and only 1% less than, the, than, um, than, than France lost in the war. It's about on par with people like Austria, Hungary, and Germany, and with the British Empire, with, all, with all, so many of these other nations, Belgium, Australia, people like that. Yeah, and, and incidentally, um, in relation, just to sort of reinforce the idea further, um, the United States lost 0.13% of its population in World War One. So, it, again, it, it um, sorry, I'm re I know that I'm repeating myself a lot here, but what the Civil War represents in the United States was the hell that was the First World War over in Europe. When we imagine, you know, the terror of the First World War, that's what people were experiencing in the American Civil War, losing entire towns, entire cities gutted of their populations, of all of these young men. The generational impact that that has, the psychological impact that that has on the civilian population sending these people to war is extraordinary. For them, you know, for the United States, the First World War was a sideshow. It was tiny. It was insignificant. 0.13% of the population lost. It was nothing when compared with the American Civil War. On its own merits, it was, of course, everything that we mentioned earlier. It was incredibly significant. It was devastating. It was hell. The First World War was hell. But when compared to the American Civil War, it was nothing. And as well, I imagine, alongside the ideas which we still, as a society deal with today of men not wanting to talk about the emotional trauma that is undergone in periods of war, you know, even worse back in the day, alongside that default position of you just bear it, you know, stiff upper lip, you just go through and you bear it like a man, the things that you experienced, you know, your buddies that you lost, the people that you saw blown to bits by artillery, you just deal with it. Imagine how worse that would even be when these guys coming home have the pretension to complain, to complain, that's how it may have been seen, about what they saw in relation to what their grandparents suffered. They would dare to say, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I lost some of my best friends out there. They would say to their grandfather, they're going to look their grandfather in the eye and say, I lost some of my best friends their grandfather who lost their father, all of their best friends, all their worst enemies, all their schoolmates, their teacher, their entire generation lost in the ranks of the, of the Civil War. Comparatively speaking, it was hardly a struggle at all in the United States. And 
I have the feeling that that factor, that that role, that cultural impact played a massive and lasting role in how and when, so to say, why, where the United States remembers the First World War, how we don't remember it all too much. To summarize very quickly, the generation of Americans who went off to fight in the First World War were still living very, very strongly under the shadows and being held back by the ghosts of the American Civil War. Even to this day, the impact, the lingering effects of the American Civil War are massive in this nation, even if it's not always recognized in the same way that perhaps it is with the First World War over in Europe. Those ghosts, there's a lot of them, and they linger for a very long time. And that, I think, is at least a very big part of the reasons why the United States has largely forgotten about the First World War. To my ever generous supporters on Patreon, again, I thank you not only for your support, but for choosing this topic of discussion today. Uh, I do hope that it was enjoyable, that I didn't ramble on for all too long. Uh, and of course, to all of my dear viewers, thank you very much as well for your support. It, it means an extraordinary amount to me. And uh, well, of course, until the next time, my dear viewers, I, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.